Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Christmas Eve candlelight service. We're going to start off by just uh, singing some songs of worship. And we're going to start off with joy to the world. So if you can just stand on your feet, join us in worship as we uh, sing these few songs. Amen. Hey. 
It's an amazing thing when you think about Mary, did she know what God was going to do in her life? It's an amazing what God will do in our life if we let him. If we let him come in our lives, he'll take his places and do things we never dreamed possible. And that's what Christmas is all about. It's about Christ coming to earth. You may be seated at this point. At this point, we're going to have an opportunity to read some Christmas reading of the Christmas story. And I'm going to ask my two assistants to make their way up. Luke and Hannah. Really appropriate for Luke to read Luke. Come on up. Come on, sweetie. Okay. Can you read that? I'll tell you like this. Here we go. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. These will be his royal titles, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. His ever-expanding, peaceful government will e never end. He will rule forever with fairness and justice from the throne of his um, ancestor. ancestor, David. The passionate commitment of the Lord Almighty will um, guarantee this. Is that Isaiah 9, 6, 7. The Lord himself will choose the son. Look, the virgin will um, come to the child. She will give birth a son and call, will call him Emmanuel, God is with us. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused, Confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't, don't be frightened, Mary, the angel told her, for God has decided to bless you. You will become pregnant and have a son, and you are, named, you are to name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel Forever, his kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can I have a baby? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby born to you will be holy and... The birth of Jesus. At that time, the Roman emperor... Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to red, red, register for their census. The be and because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judah, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary his fiancée, who is now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them, the shepherds and angels. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by the sun. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of God, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. At this time, let's take an opportunity to give back. You know, the Bible is all about giving. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give back to you what you've given to us. We ask you to bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Hey, just a couple things real quick. We'll put this back on like this. Wanted everyone to thank you so much for coming out tonight to our Christmas Eve service. We're so glad that you're here. And if this is your first time at Cornerstone Church, we have a, something called a connection card. It's just a way for us to be able to say thank you for coming. And we promise you, if you fill it out, we will not give you endless junk mail. We just want to say thank you for coming to Cornerstone Church. That's basically it. And you can see it in your program. When you leave here tonight, what you can do is you can put it in the little, um, the little boxes in the end when you leave. Here you go. And you can put the connection card there. Just want to let everyone know about that. All right. Well, listen, let's, uh, this is a great opportunity to remember what Christ has done for us. I'm going to ask you at this time if you could open your Bibles. We're going to break right into the Word of God. And how many of you ever heard the word Emmanuel? If you've been around for a period of time and you've been to church all your life, you've probably heard the word Emmanuel. And we hear it all the time, Emmanuel, God with us, God with us. So what does that really mean and what does the significance of Emmanuel, God with us, really mean? Well, let's go ahead and we're going to read a little bit first. If you want to open your Bibles or follow along the screen, we're going to look at uh, Matthew 1, 18 to 24. I'll go ahead and start reading. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, said, Joseph, son of David... The angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to his son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for the word of God, which brings light to us, that you are a light shining in the darkness. We ask that you bless this reading of the word and also bless this reading and also bless as we break open what it means that you are with us, Emmanuel, in Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, you know, sometimes I, I grew up thinking that, what is Emmanuel, God with us? We hear all these things. We tend to take them for granted. But what does it really mean? Well, it's really interesting. The word, actually, there's not one English word that does it. It takes three English words, God with us. And what is that supposed to mean? Uh, I'm a science fiction guy. I like science fiction. I'll just confess to you tonight. And I, I find it very fascinating about science and things of that nature. And there's been people believing that there's about fifth dimensions at one time, and now they believe there's 11 dimensions. And people believe that when God created the heavens and the earth, a dimension was lost. And some people think there was about 15 different dimensions, which are different realms of reality that are in the same way. I know it's kind of hard to explain, but uh, really science is, is believing that now. There are different realms of reality that are taking place simultaneously. Very interesting. And what's so interesting is that God created it all. And with all the complexity of the universe, all the complexities of the universe, God created every dimension. And the most amazing thing of all is not only did he create the dimensions, but he created you and I. So he's above it all and yet with us. I like what the, the, the doctor said, Dr. Dr. Ross said this, we doctrinally orthodox Christians potentially underestimate God's nature powers and capacities by a factor of a trillion in one dimension. He's basically saying we see God in one dimension, but there's so many other dimensions. They think up to 15. It's amazing when you think about it. It blows your mind, the complexities of who we are. Just the complexities of a beetle. You know, there's about 300 different types of beetles alone. Not the beetle rock band, but different beetles. It's just amazing when you think of all the cells that are in your body, all this incredible um, complexities, and you look at the stars, and you see all the galaxies, and yet the Bible says God is with us. And how is that supposed to happen? So there's three basic words, God with us. And the first thing is this, God is the Almighty One, but He's also Emmanuel. He's mighty, He's powerful, yet He's in the middle of what you and I do. It says in Colossians that the Spirit of Christ holds the universe together. 
Scientists tell us that in matter, there seems to be some kind of energy or cell or something that kind of holds. There's a component in nature that holds it all together. And we believe that's the spirit of Christ. In other words, the Bible says he breathed and then came life. There's a spirit of Christ which brings life and illumination to the whole universe. And some people mistakenly think it's the force or it's a God consciousness. It's, here I go, get my Star Wars thing, I'm sorry. But that people basically think that there's this basic God consciousness. If you can just get a hold of that energy cycle, that's God. No, the energy cycle is not God. God creates life. And so it's not enough just to know his creation, but to know him personally. And God says that we can know him. And so it's an amazing thing when you think about it, that God with us. God entered space and time 2,000 years ago and decided to leave heaven and come and be around one of us. The Bible says in Galatians 4.4, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive full rights as son. Which is so amazing is that Jesus left this dimension of a, a great superiority and being a great creator and decided to enter into our very world and become one of us. And what's so amazing is no one could ever conceive how Christ would become a little helpless baby dependent upon his mother through the nine-month pregnancy, dependent upon his parents to survive. Isn't it amazing? Why would God, the creator of all the universe, choose to subject himself to the natural things that you and I face as a baby, made him helpless, made him like a little child who had a nurse, who had a burp, who had to have his baby's clothes changed. An amazing thing what happened 2,000 years ago. And another thing is, which is so amazing, is that Jesus grew up and his parents sometimes questioned his judgment. One time he was in the temple, and they're looking all over for him. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? It's like, where is Waldo? You know, in, in the middle of all that going on the Passover, they couldn't find him. And they found him in the temple. And they said, Jesus, we've looked all over for you. He says, do you not know that I must be about my father's business? His parents didn't quite understand what this all meant. And what's also amazing is this. Jesus got hungry. He got irritated. We see that in Scripture. He experienced fear at times. Do you know that? Jesus experienced fear. The Bible says in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says that he had such great duress that he began to sweat drops like blood. And so science tells us today that's under a, term, under a person with tremendous anxiety. What I find so encouraging about that, despite the anxiety, despite the difficulty Jesus had, he battled through it and did the right thing no matter what. I think that brings encouragement to us to know that Christ was one of us. And he's a person that didn't live life scarless. I've, I've heard people, they've gone through difficulties, and sometimes I try to console them. I've learned very early to say, I really don't know what you're going through, but I'm just here to let you know God does. So you have no idea what I'm going through. I say, you know what? I do not have an idea what you're going through, but God does. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every capacity like you and I was, but he did not sin. In Philippians 2.6, it says, Jesus made himself nothing. He downsized from the grandiose of being the great creator. He left God and became one of us to be with us. God put skin on himself through Jesus Christ. He became a touchable. He became approachable. Just think about that. He became nothing. Jesus became nothing so we could become something. Isn't that amazing? I think a lot of us grow up ever since we're little kids, if all you got to do is watch the nursery, and you can see that everyone in that nursery wants to be somebody. They, they grab that toy, mine, and all of a sudden, everyone in that room wants that toy, whatever it is. It doesn't make a difference if it's a piece of cardboard. If one child grabs it, every child in that room says, it is mine. Everyone wants to be the leader and the, and the, the preeminence of that room. And yet Jesus laid all that down and became one of us. It's amazing. He says in Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he knew no sin and became sin for us that we could become the righteousness of God. He took all his sin, all the sin laying on us, and he took it upon himself that we could be with him. 
I like what uh, another theologian said. His name is Dick Forbes, said this. He became, he came to our place, he took our place, and invites us back to his place. Let me say that again. He came to our place, he took our place, and invites us back to his place. That's the gospel. He came to our place, he became one of us, and invites us to become what he is. I, uh, I find it so amazing because it's so easy sometimes. Uh, I grew up and I had a friend of mine, I'm not going to say his name, let's just say his name is Richard, just for the sake of uh, giving you a name. And Richard's parents went through a horrible divorce, unfortunately. And both parents tried to buy their son. And so he'd be in different custody in the same town. And his father would give him great toys. His mother would give him great toys. And he was a great guy to hang out with because he had the best toys in the entire neighborhood. And so I became his friend. He came out, you know, all the great stuff that was out. I, I, I liked the guy. He had all the great toys, but he was kind of spoiled. But, you know, he grew up struggling and grew up rebelling because it wasn't like his parents really cared about him. I remember him saying one time, my parents don't care about me. They're trying to buy me. I'll never forget him saying that. Because what they were trying to do is buy his love by giving him things, giving him things. What he really wanted was not his parents' toys and his parents' money. He wanted, he wanted them. You know, and I think what you and I need are not things. We need a person. The problem with you and I sometimes is we think that things are going to fulfill us because you and I are made in the image of God, made to have communion with God. And when God, when sin happened, there's a separation. And in us, there's a longing for the God in us someplace. And so we look for God in all the wrong ways. We, we mistaken and believe that God is within and yes, Jesus says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water when he lives in you. But you don't find God within yourself. You find God by God. And so Jesus didn't just give us something. He could have given us money. He could have given us success. He could have given us fame. And he could have given us all these wonderful things and happiness. But he didn't come for that reason. And this is why people really struggle because he came and he gave of himself. The greatest treasure and the greatest gift is not things but is yourself. And what did God do? He became one of us. Incarnate. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. I like what uh, one of my favorite theologians, A.W. Tozer, said this. Most Christians are the theoretical Christians or theological, theological Christians. He said this. They're trying to be happy without a sense of the presence of God. They're trying to be happy without the presence the sense of the presence of God. You see, it's not an information. He didn't say, I have died to give you information. No, Jesus says, I have died to have a relationship with you. He became sin so we could become the righteousness of God. You see, God is not interested in information. He's interested in transformation. He desires to know us. And so the greatest thing that anyone could ever do is give of themselves. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He gave of himself. And he even says, he says, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. I want to mention that tonight is an opportunity for all of us. No matter if you're a believer in Jesus Christ or you're just coming because it's a Christian, Christmas thing to do, I believe that Jesus was a great moral teacher. I think he was a great person. I think the Bible is great. I like it for my family, and I'll come tonight, but I frankly don't believe that in 21st century, it has any, I'm not saying this, I'm saying you might be thinking that, okay? <laughs> You're like, wow, stone me. No, don't stone me. <laughs> but you might be thinking, what relevance does it have to my life today? Some party that died 2,000 years ago, I like what C.S. Lewis said so aptly and so great. He said the following, he says, Jesus cannot be a great moral teacher. He cannot be. He says, either Jesus was a liar a lunatic or Lord. He did not leave us the option to say he was a great moral teacher because he said, I am God. From the very beginning, Matthew says, Emmanuel, God with us. First John, the Bible says, and the word became flesh. The word was a God and dwelt among us. And so Jesus says, I am God. If you want to see God, I am God. And so that's what put him on the cross. And so no great philosopher would ever say that. No, no one ever say that. Every other world, world religion says, this is the way. Jesus says, I am the way. So what is that supposed to mean? Well, I want to mention 
to you first of all, I want to apologize to you. Maybe some of you have grown up in the church or been to church or have seen the church and maybe find the church really judgmental or a lot of rules and regulations. Or, um, and I just want to tell you personally, uh, as a pastor, please forgive the church at times for coming across like we're better than anyone else. We're not better than anyone else. And I don't claim to be better than anyone else. Truth of the matter is, you know, two plus two equals four, no matter what you do. So if I say two plus two equals 3.78, that is not the right answer. Of course, the uh, Common Core says so. But that, we're not going to get into that right now. Uh, they grade you on a curve. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. I mean, numbers are numbers. Numbers don't lie. Two plus two equals four. And so if you say two plus two is 3.9999, it's still not right, the right answer. If I were to put a little arsenic in a glass of water, one drop is no longer pure anymore. And so what happens is sin pollutes us. And because we have sin, we cannot be with God. God is perfect. And what I love to hear about this so much is that some of you have been hurt by the church. Some of you have thought like the church is out there to say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, and this wrong. You have to go to church. You have to do all these things. But it is not about that. And I want to tell you today that I am no better than anyone else here. Because whether I miss it by a mile or miss it by an inch, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Doesn't make a difference how far. 2 plus 2, might, you might think it's 1,000. It's not. There's only one equation, and that's sinless. God is a just God. And because he's a just God, there has to be a penalty for sin. Why do we get so upset when we read the paper or look on the internet and see injustice? The reason we got upset is because there's something in us that justice has to be served. Why? Because we're made in the image of God, and we realize that there has to be justice. And God is a just God, and God is a God of love. And there's no such thing of, of love without justice. So there had to be a payment for that, and Christ is that payment. The Bible says the following in Romans 3.23. It says, everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Everyone has sinned. Look at your neighbor and say, you've sinned. Well, you guys are too nice to each other. Look at your neighbor and say, you sinned. Tell your neighbor, so have you. <laughs> we all mess up. We all miss it. None of us is perfect. And there has to be a payment for that because God is a God of justice. And so the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I mean, I could be the greatest person in the world. I could give everything away. I could go over to, to India. I could go to Calcutta. I could try to follow in the steps of Mother Teresa. But the Bible says that's not good enough. And so many of you think, I can never be good enough. I can never do what those church people do. It's too difficult for me. I, frankly, why even try? It's too difficult. And most men... Uh, men, we like to succeed. I mean, not just men and women, but men in particular are very competitive. We like to succeed. If we can't succeed at something, it's very, very frustrating. And so if you put this, I got to be this, dress like this, look like this, act like this, talk like this to be a Christian, I can't do it. And I've known people say, let me get my act together first, and then maybe I'll come to Christ. But the Bible says no one is good enough. And that's why Jesus came, because none of us is good enough. And so today, really, there's an invitation this Christmas Eve, an invitation to understand that Christ came to pay for our sins. What's so amazing to me is the fact that Christ came, and what did he come? He went in a barn. He went in a cave. He laid in a manger. And I, I, uh, probably some of those animals that ate out of that manger were sacrificed perhaps at the temple. And there he was, taking the place of the animals. I wonder if the animals knew that he was the sacrifice to take away. Why would God do such a thing? Why would God kill his own son, Jesus Christ? Because God loves us so much. There is no other way except through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. Why? Because God is a God of justice. And justice has to be served. And instead of putting it upon us, he put it upon Christ. What I find so encouraging, my friends, is listen, Jesus came as a baby on Christmas. 
He didn't come fully mature. He didn't come for, after 30 years, he began his ministry. And some of you are thinking that you have to get it all together before you give your life to Christ. No, you don't have to have it all together. All you have to do is say, I need Jesus and let Christ come into your life. Say, Father, I have sinned. I have made mistakes. Christ come into my life. And just as the baby Jesus grew, so Christ will grow in you. All of us, none of us have arrived yet. So you can't be good enough. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? I think that's great news. That's awesome news. You don't have to be good enough. He was good enough for us. And so all we have to do is receive and say, God, I have sinned. I receive your sacrifice for my sins. I receive Christ. Although I'm not there yet, I got a lot of things to work on. I'm going to let you grow in me, Christ. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let myself become more like you progressively. And that's what we need to do, folks. We need to give each other grace. We need to realize that we're all on a journey of grace. It doesn't mean we do whatever we want to do. But what it means is none of us are perfect. And we all desperately need God. The Bible says our righteousness is like, our right things we do are like filthy rags. Only Christ is good enough for you and me. And so I want to encourage you today that really the whole Christmas story is so simple. It's one thing. It's Christ becoming one of us, God with us. So not only is he out there, he's with us. And today I want to ask you a question. Are you absolutely for certain know that you've given your life to Jesus Christ? Do you know that Christ is your Savior and your Lord? Do you know that for sure? If you don't know for sure, you can't be good enough. So welcome to the club. It's only receiving what God has done for you. He's paid the price. He's paid the price for us. There's a debt you and I could not pay. The Bible says when he went on the cross, he said, it is finished, which basically means paid in full. How many of you wish today, I wish I had the ability to do this, I could say, I want everyone to come up here right now, and I want you to hand me your mortgage and your car payment and your student loans and your credit card, lo <laughs> credit, uh, your debt, and I will write a check, and everyone out of here tonight can walk away debt free. How many of you, if, if we made that announcement, say, come tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., and I'm going to write a check. I'm going to cancel every single debt that you have. And, and anyone else you want to come, come tomorrow morning at 10, and we're going to do it. And Kip's going to write for you. <laughs> how, I mean, how many of you, and if, if I had the ability to do it, how many of you would you come? I would come. If I could get rid of all my debt. But that's what Jesus did for us. He took all of our debt. He took all of our sin. He took all of our inadequacies upon himself. He says, paid in full. Take it from me. That's the miracle of Christmas. And so what I want to encourage you today is this. Number one, if you have never given your life to Christ, don't worry about the church. The church is imperfect. I just want to tell you that right ahead. The church is imperfect because it's full of people. But we serve a perfect Savior who loves you. And our objective, really, is to know Christ, make him known, and help each other become more like Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of this church. I don't know what church you go to, but if you don't go to our church, I encourage you to come here. Why? Because we are on a journey to become more like Jesus Christ. And we recognize none of us are there yet. And his ways are better. And he knows the way. He knows the truth. And he knows the life that's in us. So don't get discouraged. You don't have to get your act together first, by the way. All you have to do is say, God, I'm sorry. That's it. Say, God, I'm sorry. I've, I've blown it. For many people, it's very difficult to admit they're wrong. The first thing you have to do is confess your sins, it says in 1 John. Confess your sins. Say, God, I have blown it. The second thing you say is sorry. The second thing you say is forgive me. Say, God, forgive me of all of my sins. And number three, say, God, I give my life to you. I am no longer my own. I am yours. What's so amazing is this. When you do that, you become the person God created you to become. It's a process. And I, I'll say this so many times. You're going to hear me say it anytime you come to this church. You're created by God for God. Until you give your life to God, you're going to hurt yourself and other people because you're designed by God to be with God. And so what happens is as, I, as you and I submit to become more like God, we become who we're really called to become. The greatest shoe that can ever be can only be achieved through Jesus Christ. 
because Christ has made every person in this room, every person in this room has a purpose by God. Every person in this room has a redemptive purpose. The Bible says he wants all everyone to become saved. And so, my friends, that's the miracle of Christmas, is Jesus becoming flesh, becoming one of us, that he could save us. And it, it, just, it, it just, it boggles the mind. I mean, can you imagine, I, I have children, as you know, and, and I imagine that you have a little ant farm, and in that ant farm, you see they're, having, they're fighting each other, and you're like, gee, I wish I could go there and help them. And if he had the ability to become an ant, and, and be, go on that ant farm, and, and try to be one of them to save them, that's what Christ has done for us. It's just, it's just amazing. Try to ask an ant to describe our material world. Can't happen. That's the vastness and the splendor and the glory of God is so beyond us. But God loves us so much that he gave Christ for us. And so I want to encourage you tonight for two things, basically. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, tonight can be your best Christmas ever. But like any other gift, he will not force himself upon you. It's something you have to take. And so if I were to offer you a $100 bill, and I say, here's a $100 bill I'm going to give you to tonight. I can put it right here. Come up and get it. Now, I, the reason I don't have one, because I don't want to be mobbed. But until you come up and take it and make it yours. If I were to write you a check, and let's suppose I had the ability to write you a check for a million dollars to pay all your debt, and you said, you know, and let's suppose I am someone really wealthy. Suppose I'm Donald Trump, but I had better hair, okay? Imagine I'm Donald Trump. And I, I say to you, I'm going to write you a check for a million dollars. You say, yeah, he's definitely Donald Trump. I believe that he's rich and all that. And you get the check. You put it in your pocket. You go around saying, oh, yeah, you believe in, oh, yeah I believe in Donald Trump. I, I believe he has got money. I got the check right here for a million dollars. I'm going to keep it right here. You can walk around for the rest of your life with that check in your pocket. But until you take the check out, until you endorse the back of the check and say, I am putting my trust in this check, until you go to the teller at the bank and put it on the counter and say, here, I am endorsing this. Until you hand it in, it's not yours. And so just to believe in Jesus is not good enough. And you can't be good enough. It's a matter of receiving a gift, a gift of Christ. Receiving it, taking it, putting your trust in it, and then it's yours. It's that simple. So I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you want to pray it in the quietness of your heart, I'm going to ask if Esteban can make his way up. We're going to pray a prayer right now. Father, I want to thank you for dying on the cross for us. I want to thank you for coming to earth and making yourself one of us to save us. Lord, I want to thank you that you are an amazing God, that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Father, I want to thank you that you didn't wait for us. You came to us when we weren't even looking for you. And so, Lord, we thank you for that today. God, the first thing we say today is we're sorry. We're sorry for our sins. Lord, I ask that you would forgive us of our sins right now. Go ahead and ask the Lord to forgive you of all your sins, both known and unknown. Father, I ask you to forgive me. I also ask that you would fill me with your forgiveness and your healing right now. I choose to believe you are the Son of God and that you've paid the price for my sins. Now today, I put my trust in you. I put my faith in you. Fill me now and give me the grace and give me the power and the ability to walk the path you have for me in Jesus' name. I receive you, Lord. Amen. I want to pray for the rest of you as well. That how about, I don't know how you are. We talked recently about a photo bombs in our lives and things go wrong. And if you're like me, there's some areas of your life you'd like to see a lot more progress in. I got news for you. God loves you even despite your mistakes. But what he's asking us to do is to surrender our lives to him daily and say, Father, I'm sorry. Every single day, you have to go before God and say, sorry, I'm sorry I missed it. I want to become more like you. And let God transform you. Let the Christ child grow in you. Some of us have been in church for a long period of time. But the Bible says... So many of you by now should be off milk and onto solid food, but many of you aren't. And some of you are okay. You accepted Christ as that baby. But in a spiritual sense, you're still a little baby inside. And you haven't let Christ mature in your life. I want to let you know that God wants to mature in you 
Not so he can bore you. <laughs> because he can make you the person that you're called to become. And I want to encourage you. Our church is going to be having a prayer and fasting in January. We're going to encourage you every single day to get before God. If you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles at, in front. Start a New Testament. Just take 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day. It's like eating. A baby does not grow unless you feed it. And so I want to encourage you to, to dedicate yourself. Just to begin to read the Word of God and say, God, open my heart. And just start in the New Testament. Wherever, just start reading about 10 minutes a day and ask God to open your eyes to it. And you watch what's going to happen. All of a sudden, that baby Jesus inside you is going to become a toddler. And that toddler will become a teenager. And that teenager will become a man. Until you can grow up to be a strong woman or man of God. And that's the promise that we have of Christmas. It's not just salvation. It's the fact that you and I can become more like him. He loves us, but he's got so much more for us. He wants us to go on to higher and greater things. How many of you want to have a life that's worth living? How many of you want to be able to one day when you, it's your last dying breath, you say, I have finished a race. I've done what God has asked me to do. Everyone in this room, everyone can be an incredible success if you embrace Christ and say, God, uh, I'm opening my heart right on my heart and let me be the person you created me to become and let yourself grow from a baby Christian to mature in Christ. And for uh, us, for the rest of us, maybe there are a little more mature than other people. We need to be patient with each other. We need to, like you do with children, you got to bring discipline. But you do it in love, and you always do it in correction that builds that child up. And that's why we have a community of believers that meet together. We love each other, and we believe in each other that Christ can make us what we've called us to become. So Christmas is not just about accepting Christ's child, but it's also becoming a person that grows in Christ. And I pray this year, this next year, 2015, that when we go back to Christmas, that you will grow so much more than you have already because you've embraced the Christ child. You've nurtured Christ in you. And like Mary, who let Christ grow in her, may you let Christ grow in you to become the person that God has created you to become. Can we do that together? Can we encourage each other? Can we see and help each other become the great men and women of God that we're called to become? I'm going to just pray one more prayer, then we're going to sing a song. Father, I want to thank you so much that you've created us for you. And God, I just pray right now, for, for, we just pray for those that give their lives to you, but I pray for those of us in this room that have never matured past the toddler stage or the baby stage. Father, we've starved you by not eating of your word and drinking, of your, and drinking by praying. and We're not in fellowship. Father, we pray. We thank you. You love us just the way we are, but you have so much more for us. And Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that you would put a hunger for your word and for your fellowship and for your grace upon us today. Father, that we would see the Christ child grow in us and that we become mature in every way in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I, I, when I read the paper and, or uh, read the news and I see what's going on in the world today, Sometimes it's overwhelming. God, what can I possibly do to make a difference? In fact, I, I remember uh, one time I was in school, and sometimes you see all this trash, and they have adopt a block, and a company will take a, a quarter mile or a mile of an interstate, and they'll go out there and they'll pick up the trash. And, and if every, and people start doing that, next thing you know, the highway's clean. That's why when I see garbage, I'm dry, if I see garbage at a restaurant on the floor, I'll pick it up and put it in the garbage. So what difference does that make? If everyone begins to do it, the place cleans up. And so the answer for us is if we do our part and we share the light that God has given us with somebody else and we share the life-giving message and the life-giving life of Christ with each other and say, listen, I'm not perfect, but he loves me. He loves you too. You don't have to be me. Just, be, just come to Christ and let him change you. And if you and I will do that, we would show the light of Christ with each person. You know what's going to happen? All of a sudden, more and more people will be changed. And so the way we change the world is by allowing God to change us and to touch every person we can with the light of Christ. And as we do that, my friends, you and I can change the world through the power of Jesus Christ illuminating us from the inside. Why not do that?
I'm going to ask if we could all stand. We're going to have a concluding song. I'm going to ask you to bring the lights down. Silent night, holy night. We think what Jesus did for us and how his light, he was the light of the world. I'm going to ask you to be so careful with little children to keep little children from the candles. We're going to go ahead and light it. says you are the light of the world Let's sing Silent Night one more time, a cappella, just, just, just the voices. Amen. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men that they would know that you are his in Jesus' name. Merry Christmas, everybody. God bless you. If you could extinguish your candles and, and give them to the ushers as you leave the baskets, we'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas.